Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the reading of a one-shot entitled Persecution Tries to Save Everyone. Here's the summary. There's a new villain on the loose that is gaining everyone's attention. No, they aren't a mass murderer or the head of another league, a villains-esque group. They're quirkless. And that seems to be enough to shake hero society on its own. Or quirk discrimination, class 1A, and confusion. The news outlets have been buzzing over a new villain recently. They call themselves Persecution, which sounds pretty ominous, but they aren't a typical villain, and that's why the news is so interested in them. For one, they don't do any typical villainous acts, per se, but the media portrays them as a villain for what they stand for. They're quirkless, the first well-known quirkless villain. They haven't done any harmful or inherently dangerous crimes. A lot of it was simply trespassing or vandalism. At one point, they even stole a very expensive pre-quirk painting from a museum, only to return it a day later. They were smart. Very smart. They've never been caught. They've never even been seen, except when they want to be seen. They slip into museums, banks, even hero agencies, then steal or vandalize something and slip out undetected. They never kept what they stole either. It always appeared back where they stole it from, or at a nearby police station, delivery completely unnoticed, and the item unharmed, always with a little note signed by persecution themselves. A lot of people thought they weren't actually quirkless, though, because they did a lot of things that quirkless people can't. Like successful crime, for example. Persecution actually posted an x-ray of their double toe joint as proof that they were in fact quirkless and that, yes, quirkless people could do all of the things they were doing. That was their whole point, after all. Every crime they committed, everything they vandalized, stole, and everywhere they broke into was all to spread a message. The quirkless can do anything. They are not less than quirked people. They do not deserve to be treated as such. They are not weaker, less evolved, or useless. That is what persecution believed. That was what they wanted people to know. And it was working. The fact of their quirklessness caused the media's upheaval and the attention focused on them. Yes, they were portrayed as a villain, even though they were committing pretty harmless crimes. But because they were under so much scrutiny, their message was starting to be received. Some lesser-known pro-heroes were taking note of persecution's actions, looking at the cause of them, and seeing what they were trying to say. Fundraisers and awareness campaigns were beginning to pop up. More focus was being shifted to the plight of the quirkless population, which, although it was significantly less people than those with quirks, they were ultimately treated a lot worse. Statistics came to light. Studies were done. Things were noticed now. The people who were shoved into the shadows were finally getting a little light. Shoda, for one, was all for it. He was known around UA as a pretty big quirk discrimination activist given how he was treated for his own weak quirk in his youth. He didn't know any quirkless people, but he had seen the facts. As an underground hero, he, more often than he liked, had to talk people down from suicide, and the overwhelming majority of those he met were quirkless and children, convinced to kill themselves because of how society treats the quirkless in this age. For being such a small fraction of the population, the suicide rate was high. Too high. So Shoda is happy that is beginning to change, thanks to persecution, though he is pretty curious what his students think about all this. Everyone in Class 1A has a strong quirk, though there are some that have physical mutations that might cause for some discrimination, but all in all, none of his students have a mental quirk, and definitely not no quirk, given the bias of the entrance exam, not to say those with less physical quirks can't defeat robots, it's just a lot harder. Anyways, Shoda's class is partially full when he arrives on a Friday morning. He takes his place in his sleeping bag against the wall, and pretends to sleep while observing his students' interactions. There's some relationship gossip, people complaining about homework, and there, a group of students hovering around Kaminari's desk, watching what appears to be a recent newscast. Shoda can just make out the tiny voice through his phone speaker. Recent attacks by the villain Persecution. They broke into Endeavor's hero agency late Wednesday night, leaving the following message written on a portrait of Endeavor himself. Kaminari tapped his phone screen and brought it closer to his face, presumably looking at an image of the vandalism. He snorted incredulously. Did they seriously write their message using hot pink glitter paint? What a mood. Sarah leaned over and snickered while Mina whined. What's it say, though? Kaminari passed his phone over and Mina read aloud. Heroes are not always right. Signed, persecution, and yep, pink glittery paint. That's a pretty short thing to write after all the effort they must have made to break in. But it gets the message across, Sarah pointed out. There was a small cluster surrounding the group now. Oui, we can see the point. It's very simple, Ayama said. I approve of the medium. C'est magnifique. I think it can have multiple meetings, though, Caro. The whole group turned to look at Asui. What do you mean? Kirishima asked, having walked into the conversation a few minutes prior. Asui put a finger to her chin and thought. 
Well, Carol, could be literal, which would be pretty obvious, but it could also be a commentary about how society is not always right, or the government is not always right, since both of those things revolve around heroes and quirks, Carol. Shota could find himself agreeing with Asui's statement as he listened in. I guess. Kaminari flung his head back dramatically. I wonder why they did it in Endeavor's agency, though. Wouldn't it be, like, super hard to break in there? That's probably the point, a new voice said quietly, all heads whipped around to face Midoriya, who had snuck into class without anyone noticing. He let out a quiet squeak, at all the eyes suddenly on him. What do you mean, Mido bro? Kirishima slung an arm over Midoriya's shoulder, who began fiddling with his hands. Well, since persecution is quirkless, and the whole point of him doing what he's doing is to raise awareness toward quirkless people and prove that they aren't lesser or weak, would it make sense to do something brash like breaking into the number one hero's agency? I mean, if he can do it, and he's quirkless, then that must prove that he's really capable, right? Shota could see that many of the students listening also nodded along to Midori's statement. I guess that makes sense, Mina said cheerily, as the bell to start class rang and everyone rushed to their seats. Shota stood, his sleeping bag dropping around him, and prepared to begin class. He eventually wants to have a class discussion about persecution and quirk discrimination, and based on this morning conversation, he knew it would be interesting. But for now, he'll stick to normal lessons. He wants to get a good basis to plan their discussion around first, and knowing his class, gossips the whole lot of them. He knew there would be more, outside of class, unfiltered talk that he could listen in on, so it could wait for now. Class is over in no time, and everyone's back in the dorms, the majority convening in the common room, the perfect time for Shota to observe as he grades papers nearby. The chatter is light, and mostly about schoolwork until someone mentions the topic of interest again. I wonder if they'll catch persecution soon. Shota isn't sure who said it, but it sounded like Yagirozu. His suspicions were confirmed when Chiro turned and said to her directly, Well, they seem pretty smart. They haven't been tracked or anything yet. They don't even have an identity. Yagirozu tugs lightly on a strand of her hair. I suppose, but they are quirkless after all. They can't go on much longer. This got a few confused expressions and a few nods of agreement. But, like, isn't their whole point in doing this to prove that being quirkless doesn't mean anything in terms of ability? The quirkless people are less evolved, so they're practically not human. Mineta snickered as he inched closer to where Yayorozu and Jiro were sitting. Ida, who was nearby in an armchair, gave a solid chop before agreeing. Yayorozu and Mineta, although brash, are correct. It's only a matter of time before persecution must pay for their heinous crimes. Their lack of quirk will serve as a way for heroes to catch them easily. Shota observed his students' facial expressions from where he was sat. Most looked contemplative. A few were nodding. Even less looked even remotely upset. One of which was Midoriya. They're not really heinous crimes, Ida, Midoriya muttered almost to himself. No one seemed to hear him over the boisterous change in conversation topic. No one but Shota and no one seemed to notice the perturbed expression on his prom child's face either, nor the way he looked vaguely uncomfortable with the topic, but also like he was holding himself back from saying more. Strange. Midori doesn't usually hold back what he wants to say. Half the time it just seems to spill out on its own, anyways. Shota shrugs to himself and turns back to grading, tuning out the less relevant chatter. He supposes it'll make more sense when they discuss it in class. Early the next morning, Shota's back in the classroom in his prime observation spot. Class is empty when he first arrived. With Ida showing up mere three minutes after him and Midori a few minutes after Ida, they greet each other briefly before Midori takes his seat as well, pulling out a well-worn notebook and a pencil. His student scribbles furiously, a hand resting over his mouth to prevent mumbling, but Shota catches a few words that warm their way out, since the room is mostly empty. Quirkless, how, is all Shota can make out before a new group of students walk in loudly and Midori snaps his notebook shut. Honestly, Shota expected his problem child to be interested in persecution. He's very analytical, and from what Shota had seen and heard of his notebooks, he is good at figuring out quirks and their uses. It makes sense that he'd be curious about someone quirkless. Soon all the students file in, and Shota gets ready to begin class. He was up late last night, when isn't he, writing up a lesson plan to go over quirk discrimination today. Persecution is a good segue into the topic, being of interest in pop culture currently, so he begins there. Good morning, Hellions. He begins, receiving assorted greetings in return. He jumps right into the lesson. I'm assuming you've all heard about the quirkless villain, Persecution. He looks out across the class to gauge reactions, most nodding or verbally agreeing. Midoriya, however, tenses slightly. He gets right to the chase. What do you think of them? An influx of overlapping voices overwhelms the room, to which he activates his quirk and glares out at the class, cutting them all off. Raise your hands. 
he huffs out. A few shoot up immediately. He points to Kaminari. They're like, really cool. It's crazy how they haven't been caught yet, and no one even knows who they are. Many heads nod, with Kirishima shouting out, So manly. Shota raises his hand to placate the noise. Now Yorozu's hand raises gracefully. Shota gestures to her to speak. I don't think it's very cool, as you said, Kaminari. They are a villain and they need to be punished. I'm sure it won't be long. The statement gets nods before Chiro raises her hand as well. Just because they're quirkless doesn't mean it'll be easier to catch them. She sounds a little irritated, most likely from the discussion the night previous, where young Yorozu brought up the idea that the quirkless were lesser. There's a lot of noise to this comment. Shota should have known this topic would have been loud. He hears Tokiyami amidst the chatter. What a mad banquet of darkness. He runs a hand against his temple. As his students speak over each other, he really should have known. Quiet down, class. Thankfully, they listen to him. Remember to raise your hands. This is a discussion, not a free-for-all. Two hands pop up. He motions to Mina first. It is pretty cool that they're super smart, and I'm glad that they're not hurting anyone, but they definitely need to be caught eventually since they're a villain. He does next. I agree with them needing to be caught, Mina. A chop interrupts his statement. But nothing they are doing is remotely cool besides not hurting people, like you mentioned. They are a villain, plain and simple. Bakugo speaks without prompt. Yeah, that stupid, quirkless villain needs their butt kicked. Shouldn't be too hard. I could take him easy. Another chop from Ida. Bakugo, I must ask you to refrain from such brash behavior. We must leave this to the pros. Saro laughs. I'm sure all of us could take him, buddy. They're quirkless. Shouts of agreement follow... From the rowdiest of the class, Shota feels like he has a good clue as to who in his class holds more prejudice. He glanced around the classroom, once again, as the yelling devolves into harmless chatter. The more boisterous students talk loudly while Ida tries to rein them in. Many are just sitting quietly, waiting for class to resume. Midori, it seems, has shrunk down quite a lot in his seat over the course of the conversation. Shota didn't notice before now, but he hadn't spoken a word, and had his head down and shoulders pulled in slightly. It's not like Midori had to zone out or get distracted in class, and he hadn't touched his notebook, which is slightly concerning. Shota wonders if he knows someone quirkless, and it's upsetting to hear people talk like they are less than human, but he'd be likely to stick up for them if that were the case. It is really strange how a student has been reacting to conversations surrounding persecution, especially since he has such a strong quirk and most likely face no judgment for it. It's not even a mutant type, though it does have its drawbacks, but he digresses. That's enough. Shota speaks over the clamor, students quieting almost instantly. Having such a strict reputation was very useful. So, now that we've discussed persecution some, we're going to take a vote. He scanned across the confused faces. I want you to think about persecution and what they do, and vote if you are for or against them. Ida's hand immediately shot up. Sensei, shouldn't we all be against them? Given we are heroes in training and they are villain, it would be wrong for us to agree with them. That's fair, Ida. But I want you to take into account everything about persecution, what they stand for, their actions, who they are. Don't just see villain and claim they're evil. Think for yourselves. A lot of thoughtful expressions. So, Shota began, raise your hand if you disagree with them. The majority of the class's hands went up. He pointed to Todoroki. Why? The dual-haired student looked thoughtful, eyebrows twitching almost imperceptibly before responding in a cool tone. Persecution is a villain. While their actions are not physically hurting others, they are still harmful acts. They should go through other means if they intend to make a statement. Shota nodded. Okay. He gestured outwards. Uraraka, how about you? She pursed her lips softly before speaking. Like Todoroki-kun was saying, even if they aren't hurting people, they're still breaking the law. That makes them a villain. And we're going to be heroes. We can't agree with villains. Shota sighed internally. Really, they were getting nowhere with this discussion. His students were missing the point. He continued anyway, pointing to another student who disagreed. Well, Yagirozu began, persecution is committing crimes. I disagree with them because it's illegal. Plus, the only reason they're doing all this is because they're quirkless. There's really no point to it. They seem to be lashing out over a genetic problem. Yeah, Mineta added, uninvited. They're just mad since they're basically less human. He scoffed and rolled his eyes. They deserve it. Showed his eye twitch. This student in particular was showing less and less potential as time progressed. If he can't show any growth soon, Shota may just have to expel him. Tokiyami was next, saying, While I don't agree with their actions, persecution is doing it for a good cause. I agree that quirk discrimination is bad, having experienced some. But I've heard it's worse for the quirkless. Suyu was on a similar page, as was Ashido, Kirishima, and Kaminari. Shota's eyes landed on Bakugo, who disagreed as well. This should be interesting. That quirkless scrub is a villain. 
They'll be taken down soon enough, and they deserve it. Useless idiot. Bakugo mutters the last part, to which Midoriya, sitting directly behind him, flinches slightly, sinking ever lower in his seat. Okay, class, some fair points. Now those who agree. Shota watched as fewer, more hesitant hands popped up. Few enough, in fact, to count on one hand. Jiro, Koda, Aoyama, and Midoriya are the only ones to raise their hands in agreement. Shota hears an appalled gasp from Ida, presumably, as well as a few confused murmurs. Since there are so few of you, you all get to explain why. Shota began. Aoyama, you start. His students smiled at the attention. For moi, I agree with persecution because they are not hurting anyone. And it is all to end discrimination, which would be très bon. He sweeps his arm in a flourish, glitter released from his palm. Shota sighs at the theatrics, but is grateful some of his students can see. Koda's next, answering in a short whisper. Yeah, discrimination is not fun. Shota nods and moves on to Jiro, who looks pretty determined. My dad is quirkless, she says straightforwardly, a few soft gasps around the room. He got a lot of hate for it when he was a kid. Still does, actually. But he also said that it wasn't nearly as bad when he was younger because the quirkless population was larger then. Most quirkless people are in my dad's generation or older. Ones who are our age are rare and treated much worse because of it. So yeah, I agree with what persecution is doing. They're not hurting anyone, and they're spreading awareness for something that most people ignore. Jiro leans back in her desk and crosses her arms, daring anyone to argue with the glare that Shota approves of. He nods, then looks to Midoriya, the last of those who agree and the most confusing. Shota's quite curious about his reasoning. Midoriya sits up in his seat, clasps his hands nervously on his desk, and gulps. I agree with persecution because, um, they aren't hurting anyone. The, uh, media portrays him as a villain, but I don't really think that he should be called that. Yes, he does illegal things, but he isn't a villain. He just got that label put on him because society doesn't want to deal with what he's trying to bring to light. Quirkless discrimination is, uh, really bad, especially for this generation, like Jiro mentioned, so what persecution is doing, I agree, needs to be done. He isn't harming anyone, and is getting a message out there that should not even be a problem at all. Midoriya pauses for a moment, in which Saro asks, But shouldn't they have just done it a different way? I mean, there's no need to commit crime to raise awareness. There are sounds of agreement all across the room. Midoriya responds, If that would work, it would have been done already. Midoriya pulls out his phone, glancing at Jota, who nods shortly. He scrolled for a moment before continuing. I'm, um... Following three separate quirk discrimination awareness accounts on social media, all three have good, accurate information post regularly and respond to messages politely. They all have a total of 247 followers. He looks pointedly at Cero. The point persecution is trying to make isn't fun and doesn't affect a lot of people, but those who it does affect really need to be heard. This way is efficient and almost guaranteed to be noticed. Midori exhales, finished with his spiel. All very good points, show to wonders, however, what prompted a student to know all of that? Most likely something akin to Jiro. Shota smirks and claps his hands together, bringing attention back to him. Midoriya is correct. Not that you have to agree with persecution, but that what they're doing is good. Sure, heroes shouldn't agree with villains, and yes, we shouldn't condone crime, but it really is the most efficient way to bring awareness to this topic, and... Shota clicks on his projector. It's greatly needed. Staggering gasps can be heard as the students process the information on the board. Statistics on chances of the quirkless being bullied and being abused. Suicide rates, unemployment rates for those that make it to adulthood. It's all very upsetting facts, but his students need to understand. The bell rings abruptly, causing several newly paled students to jump. Showed a sighs, just as they were getting somewhere. He hates to leave on such a distressing note, but at least his students will have time to mull it over. We'll continue this on Monday. Showed announces as his students slowly blink back into awareness. He ends with, think about it and marches briskly out the door. That evening, Shota returned to the dorm common rooms, where many of his students are gathered. It seems that they plan to have a movie night, since it's Friday and the curfew is extended tonight. The entirety of the class, minus Bakugo, is crammed on the couches and the floor surrounding it in front of the TV. He smiled slightly at his students fussing over what movie to watch, throwing snacks and pillows at each other. It's nice to see them all act like teenagers sometimes, and not have to be stressed over villain attacks. He counts their heads as a precaution. It became habit after almost losing one of them. Eighteen. Shota furrows his brow. Who's missing? Bakugo was in his room, given that it was 8.30, but who else? He scans the room. Ah, a familiar head of green curls is notoriously absent. Problem child. Shota walks over to his students, getting their attention. They quiet down a little and blink up at him. Where's Midoriya? Uraraka waves her hand at him. 
Deku-kun said he needed to go to the store. He said he would be back before curfew, though, and didn't mind us watching the movie without him. She frowns a little, obviously thinking about something that's bothering her. Shota sighs. At least they know where he is, and if he's back before curfew, it's no problem. Although, Shota would have preferred someone go with him, but given his personality, he probably wouldn't want to hinder anyone else's movie watching. Shrugging, he returned to the table he was sitting at behind the couch. The movie begins while Shota grades papers and, sneaking a glance, he sees that it is some short, prequel superhero movie that he's never seen. Eventually, the movie ends and everyone starts to head back to their respective rooms, picking up trash from snacks and fixing the couch cushions. Shota looks at his phone for the time. It's 9.48, 12 minutes until curfew, and Midori has yet to return. He's been gone for about an hour. Shota wonders what he needed to get from the store. Maybe it was something really specific that took a while to find, or a store that's far away. Regardless, the problem child has never been late to curfew, so he doubts he intentionally will be. Shota just hopes he hasn't run into a villain. He's known for being a trouble magnet, after all. Shota's pondering comes to a close when Midori rushes into the building five minutes before curfew, breathing hard like he ran all the way here. He wasn't carrying a shopping bag, but had his backpack on. Cutting it a little close, problem child. Shota greets as Midoriya walks in. S Sorry, Sensei. The store I went to was out of stock, so I had to go to a different store that was kind of far away. Shota nods. That's fine. Just try to leave a little earlier next time in case stuff like this happens. Midori smiles brightly and heads for the stairs. I will, Sensei. Good night. Shota waves in response. Good night, kid. He watches as a student disappears up the stairs, hauling that bright yellow backpack. Shota's heading to his own on-campus apartment when it hits him. Midori never mentioned what he got from the store. Saturday morning, the dorms are already abuzz with energy. Most students tend to sleep in on the weekends, and today is no exception. It's around 10 by the time almost all of the students are downstairs eating breakfast or chatting in small groups. Some of the more studious ones are already doing homework for Monday. A group is sitting in front of the TV flipping channels when it lands on a news station. Wait, wait, stop it here! Kaminari yells to Uraraka, who had the remote. His yell gets the attention of most of the kids who turn to look at the screen. The bold headline reads, Persecution Strikes Again. Ooh, Ashido squeals, sitting next to Uraraka on the couch. I wonder what they've done this time. Me too, Uraraka replies to her, turning up the volume slightly. Shota walks a bit closer to better hear the TV as the newswoman reads the story. Villain persecution strikes again last night, breaking into the Museum of Prequork Art and stealing a famous painting. They left a message in place of the piece. A picture of a sticky note pops onto the screen with a message scribbled in black marker reading, We are not weak, and signed by persecution. The newscaster pauses to glance at the paper in front of her. The artwork was found completely undamaged at a nearby police station. There are no leads as to who persecution is. All we know is that the crime was committed sometime between 8 and 12 o'clock last night, based on the missing security footage. If you have any information about persecution, please call the number on the screen. A number pops up, but the class has already dissolved into chaos. Already? They sure are fast at committing crimes. Wow, they must be good with hacking if they disabled all the cameras. They do seem smart, Caro. They're not cool. Anyone can do that. Oh, yeah? I doubt you can. Stop arguing, guys. That's not very manly. Shota zoned out as the conversation drifted to other topics. He sincerely hopes that his students remembered what they had discussed in class, but unfortunately, a lot of them tend to forget the week's lessons come the weekend. Oh, well, I'll just have to drill it into them on Monday. The rest of the weekend passed quickly and uneventfully, except for the news about persecution on Saturday. The biggest thing to happen aside from that was Bakugo exploding one of the couches after Kaminari bugged him for homework answers on Sunday night. Shota had been in his apartment inside the dorm when a loud knock sounded on his door. He opened it to a panicking Kaminari. What is it? There's a fire! Shota entered the common area briskly, only to see his students, heroes in training, running around a flaming couch screaming. It would be pretty funny if they weren't being trained for situations similar and more severe to this one. Eventually, Yayorozu came into the room and created a fire extinguisher to put it out. Shota ran a tired hand down his face as everyone congratulated and thanked her. He left the room and immediately went to sleep. But he digresses. Eventually, homeroom came around Monday morning, all of his students already seated when he walked into the class. They looked ready to learn for once. He quirked an eyebrow up at their attention, to which Ida raised his hand. We are all ready to continue Friday's lesson, Sensei. Many students nodded. Very well. Shota couldn't help a little smile. They were learning. He quickly sets up the projector, with the same statistics from Friday displayed to the room. We left off talking about the quirkless population, and how persecution is working to change that. He motions to the rates listed on the board. 
This is what a quirkless individual in this generation is very likely to face. He clicked the next slide. Here are the rates from 50 years ago. It was significantly less likely, the highest rate being bullying. And here, he clicked to another slide, are the rates of quirkless individuals now versus quirked individuals. Murmurs flitted throughout the crowd as the class took in the information. Quirkless individuals face between five and eight times more discriminatory acts than those with quirks, the majority of quirk discrimination being toward those with perceived villainous quirks and those with mutation-type quirks. A lot of times, those with strong emitter-type or transformative quirks will never face quirk discrimination in their lifetime. Shoda gazed across the room. The majority of you here fall under that category, but those of you who do not, or anyone who has faced quirk discrimination, feel free to share your experiences with the class. If you're uncomfortable with sharing, there's no pressure to. It is just a good way to help your classmates to understand quirk discrimination more. Shota quieted and watched as his students silently think about all he said. He could see a few students struggle with deciding to share or not, mainly Shoji, Kirishima, Kota, and Asui. There was also a strange look on Midoriya's face, once again, but Shota couldn't really decipher it. He probably needs to talk with his problem child after class to figure out what's going on. After a few minutes of quiet, one of Shoji's hands raised. People were always acting afraid of me, and made fun of how I looked behind my back. They said I looked more like a villain than a hero. Shoji spoke out of his mouth tentacle. Kirishima whispered, That's not very manly, to himself. Thank you for sharing. Aizawa let his more severe expressions slip into something calmer. He knows this can be a difficult thing to talk about, given his own experience. Kirishima immediately raised his hand, jumping up from his seat. A lot of my old classmates said my quirk wasn't flashy enough, or it was too weak for me to be a hero. I'm going to be the manliest hero ever and prove them wrong. He slammed his hardened fist together before flopping back down. Shota saw many students smile at his enthusiasm, and even heard a few whispered encouragements. Shota nodded to Kirishima, and Aoyama raised his hand. My quirk isn't suited to my body, and some classmates were less genteel about it. Shota supposed that makes sense, given how he was one of the only ones to, somewhat surprisingly, agree with persecution on Friday. Asui is the last to raise her hand. A lot of people give me strange looks in public, especially if I'm out with my family, since we all have frog-like expressions. Mina turned in her seat and patted Asui's hand comfortingly. Thank you all for sharing your experiences. If you feel like you need to talk to a professional about anything like this, or otherwise, you can talk to me. That goes for everyone else as well. He glances around the room and, seeing majorly understanding expressions, he nods tersely and continues on to the next slide. A few years ago, many villains were interviewed over their reasons for turning to villainy. Here are the results. He paused to allow his students to read the listed reasons. Bullying because of their quirk. Abuse because of their quirk, isolation because of their quirk, no one would accept their quirk except for a group of villains, told they couldn't become a hero because of their quirk that led to disillusionment with hero society, unemployment due to their quirk. As you can see, it all comes back to quirk discrimination. How many potential heroes were told that they couldn't be one because of their quirk, and felt they had no choice but to turn to villainy either for revenge, to survive, or just feel like they belong somewhere? Many students looked sad, nervous, and somewhat even regretful. There were two that stood out, however. Bakugo, for one, had a face of almost shock. It was close to that, but it held a mix of guilt and anger as well. Midoriya, for the other, looked very pale and nervous, fingers twitching below his desk. Shota was definitely talking with him sometime today. Speaking of, time was almost up. Quirk discrimination is a very serious subject that many people tend to ignore. What persecution is doing is bringing attention to a group of people, however small, that are being ignored in their suffering. A quirkless are more likely to die before adulthood, and if they make it to adulthood, it is hard for them to find a job. The majority die or become villains before reaching the age of 30. Something needs to change here, and that's what persecution is aiming for. Now, before class ends, one last question. That got the students' attention. Do you think that persecution is really a villain? Many hands shot up almost immediately, and many more voices spoke without prompt. No, but they're still a criminal. Yes, even villains can have good causes sometimes. I don't think they should be called a villain. Me neither. I do, even if it's because of bad things happening to them, they didn't have to resort to crime. Shota cuts the voices off with a raised hand. What should they be called, then? Silence is all that responds to him for a minute. Maybe just a criminal? They are breaking the law. Yeah, that makes sense. A hand raises amidst the agreements. Midoriya, do you have an idea? The class all turns to look at the green-haired boy, who glanced nervously around the room. Y yes, I do. 
I don't think persecution is a villain, but I don't think he should be called a criminal either. While he does commit crimes, he never harms anyone, and anything he steals is always returned unharmed. He's closer to a vigilante in that regard, though he isn't actively stopping crimes. Even so, many laws were written to pertain to quirk usage, so the description of a quirkless criminal is somewhat a gray area. I think it would be more accurate to call him an activist. He's using non-harmful means to promote his cause. Shota smiled at that response. I agree, problem child. You're correct in everything you said. The bell rings suddenly, and the students begin shuffling their things for the next class. Midoriya. Shota steps closer to his desk and speaks quieter. Come to my office before lunch. His student's eyes widen, and he nods nervously. Shota simply leaves, allowing the next teacher to begin their lesson. Midori arrives at his office, as promised, knocking gingerly on the door. Shota calls him in, and he prompts him to sit in one of the chairs he has out. He's practically radiating anxiety, wringing his hands in his lap. Calm down, you're not in any trouble. Shota sits in front of him as he gets a shaky nod. He almost rolls his eyes. How could someone so powerful on the battlefield be so nervous over a conversation? I just wanted to ask about some things regarding our recent topic in class. You had some strange reactions to some of the questions. His student stiffens. Care to explain? Midoriya simply fidgets with his sleeve. What? What do you want to know? Shota sighs. Learning anything about this kid is like pulling teeth. What do you want to tell me? Uh, Shota pinched the bridge of his nose. Kid, you looked really nervous most of the class today and Friday. I just want to understand why, so I can get you help if you need it. Is there something going on at home, or is it a topic we discussed? Nothing's wrong at home. It's, it's the topic. Okay, so what about it makes you so nervous? I'm not nervous. Shota lets out an exasperated noise, like pulling teeth. Yes, you were. Are. I get it if you don't want to talk to me about it, but if something makes you react like you did, it's probably a big deal, and you should talk to someone. Midoriya worries his bottom lip between his teeth. I, I guess I can tell you. You won't expel me, right? Shota raises an eyebrow. Is it something I should expel you for? His student waves his hands frantically in front of his face. N no, no, or at least I don't think so. Shota makes a go-on motion with his hand. Well, um... I was a late bloomer, like really late. How late? Fifteen? Shota blinks. Oh. Oh. That's... Impossible? I know. Midoriya lets out a tiny chuckle. But here I am. So, you were nervous when we were discussing quirk discrimination because... Because I experienced it for eleven years, yeah. The student looks down and fidgets with his sleeves again. Everyone thought I was quirkless. And if that doesn't explain so much, how he acted for the first few weeks of school, like he was expecting to be attacked during class, how Bakugo reacted on the first day of school. Bakugo thought you were quirkless. Yeah. You've known each other for a long time. Just a nod this time. Shota furrowed his brows. Bakugo had looked guilty today while they were discussing the discrimination in the quirkless face. Was he your bully? Midoriya simply nods. Shota face palms. Dear Lord, he missed something big. Why didn't you tell anyone? We could have helped. Bakugo probably would have been expelled, due to UA's no-bullying policy. I didn't think anyone would care. It doesn't matter anyways. Kachan and I have worked through it a little, and he's doing much better. This kid. We'll come back to that later, but still, kid, if I had known about you getting your quirk so late, I could have helped. Maybe you wouldn't have broken all those bones. I guess, but... All Might knew I was quirkless before. Shota narrowed his eyes. Why did All Might know, but not me? His student puts a hand on the back of his neck, something he does when he's nervous. Uh, well, he... Okay, fine. Don't tell me if you're just going to lie. Midoriya's eyes widened in shock. I wasn't going to lie. Yes, you were. I'll just ask All Might later. But, but it's a secret. He slapped a hand over his mouth like he had meant to say that. You being quirkless was a secret, or your connection to All Might is? Don't look so surprised, problem child. Anyone can see you two have a connection. Either you tell me or I beat it out of All Might myself. His already wide eyes got impossibly bigger, and he flailed his arms around in front of him. No, don't do that. I, ugh, I can tell you, I guess. All Might has people he told anyways. I know he said I should keep it a secret for the safety of the people around me, but you're my teacher and a pro-hero, and you can protect yourself. Plus, 
might be beneficial for you to know the origins of my quirk, since I'm going to be around you for three years especially. If something weird happens, since it's pretty unknown still how it'll react differently to me than how it did to All Might, given what I saw at the sports festival. Midoriya dissolves into muttering, bringing a hand up to cover his mouth. Shoda, on the other hand, is reeling at what he was able to hear. The origins of my quirk? What does that mean? Midoriya, what do you mean by all of that? The green hat jumps a little, cutting off his rambling. Oh, I said all that out loud, didn't I? Shoda sent a deadpan gaze at him. Yes. His student bites his thumbnail, appearing to think for a moment before nodding to himself. Okay, so, basically. He then proceeds to tell Shoda the exact circumstances to where his quirk came from. So you're telling me, Shoda says, rubbing his temples in vain to try and stave off the coming headache. That All Might told you that you couldn't be a hero without a quirk, then decided to give you his quirk and train you for the UA entrance exam, only transferring his quirk the day of the exam. His student lets out a wobbly smile. Yep, that's about it. So, you're actually quirkless. Mm-hmm, I have the toe joint and everything. Shoda puts his head in his hands and groans. Um, you're not going to expel me, are you? No problem, child. He quickly adds on. And I'm not mad at you, either. I am mad at All Might, however, but I will take my concerns up with him later, for now. Is there anything else that you want to tell me? Before Midoriya says anything, however, Shota has what he might describe as an epiphany. Shota is an underground hero, meaning that he tends to rely more on strategy than brute strength, so he considers himself to be pretty clever. And because of that, he has the feeling that he was missing something important about his students since they had began the discussion about persecution. Not just the way Midoriya acted in class, which could mostly be explained by his previous quirklessness, but the other little things he'd said and done lately. He was nervous when talking about persecution to others, and tried to refrain from speaking. He referred to persecution as a he, even though no one knows their gender. He is incredibly skilled at analysis and is one of the most clever students. He was adamant about persecution being an activist, not a criminal or a villain. He insisted on going alone to the store for something and didn't say what he got. He was gone during the time frame that Persecution's latest act took place. He was quirkless. He has the double toe joint. Damn. You're Persecution, aren't you? Shota said suddenly. Bringing his student out of his thoughts, Midoriya gaped at him, eyes wide and mouth open. What? He whispered, disbelieving. You're Persecution. Am I wrong? His student's eyes flicked around the room like he was looking for an escape route. Shota glared at him, eyes red and all. He squeaked and let out a quiet... Maybe? Kid, what you're doing is illegal. Shout aside into his hands. And you're not even really quirkless anymore. Maybe I'm not, but as long as people think persecution is, it'll still work. Midori clenched a fist, determination filling his eyes. Shota gave him a narrow glare through his fingers. So, how do you do it, huh? I'm assuming you don't use your quirk. Nope, his student chirped, seemingly pleased. I've done everything completely quirkless. It's not that hard to just use your brains. He tapped a finger to his temple. Plus, Nezu-san is a great teacher. Now Shota was the one to gape. Nezu's in on this? Midoriya nods. That little rat. He grumbles to himself, then stops, eyes widening slightly. And he's teaching you? His student once again eagerly nods. He's the one teaching me how to program, among other things. I knew the basics, of course, but he's much more skilled. Shota was, for lack of a better word, shook. How long has this been going on? Well, Midori puts a hand to his chin. Nezu-san noticed my journal shortly after we moved into the dorms. I'm pretty sure he read them through security cameras. He invited me to meet with him, and eventually he said he wanted to take me as a student. At some point, we were discussing the failures of hero society and the injustices certain groups have to go through when I brought up how my past quirklessness was really difficult. He already knows about my quirk, by the way, but anyways, so I wanted to do something about it, and Nezu said that if I came up with a plan, he would help me, so here we are. Midori giggles a little at the end of his spiel. We also had a bet as to when someone would figure it out. We both thought you would be first, but Nezu-san thought that you would take much longer. He'll be impressed. That freaking rat. Corrupting one of his sweetest students and training him to take down hero society that revolves around quirks. Shota had no doubt that they could do it, either. Persecution, which the rat is in on, was already changing things. Midoriya tilts his head to the side and looks up at him with big, doe eyes. I'm not in trouble, am I? Good lord. Shota should have just expelled this class from the start. Nothing but trouble. No, if Nezu's in on it, I can't really do anything. Plus, he gives a student a sly grin. 
I never said I disagree with it. His prom child puts a big, sunshiny smile on his face. Thank you, Sensei. Eventually, he would need to get help from Midoriya so he could learn to deal with his past. Eventually, he would need to have a discussion with All Might and Bakugo. Eventually, he might even have to deal with the repercussions of a UA hero in training committing crimes once a week. Of course, problem child. But for now, he'll let persecution try to save everyone. All right, listeners, this concludes the one shot entitled Persecution Tries to Save Everyone. Let me know your guys' thoughts and reactions to this one. I like it a lot. It's a great fic that discusses a lot with the porkless discrimination, but also pulls in a little bit of vigilante Izuku into it too. So again, let me know your thoughts and reactions. But as always, thank you so much for listening.